Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Now, we should all be cautious of caring for our environment and making small, sustainable changes in our day-to-day lives. So why not start by making some delicious changes? Stone Lee Wines create their premium wine in New Zealand, and it's made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified. Stone Lee's Sauvignon Blanc expresses vibrancy and fresh flavours of the Marlborough region and is a minimal intervention wine and collaborates with nature. We have a unique discount for our listeners so you can get 20% off Stone Lee Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. Hey guys, it's Michael here. Shortest of um, introductions really today because this is the final episode of the current series. So we won't be here next week. We're having one week's break before we then bring you the next series. But I just wanted to say hi. Uh, I'm letting Ellen do the news for this episode because you've actually got quite a lot of me this week because I've been to Q and I've interviewed Bree Langley about the water lily garden that is replanted each season. So we had a really, really cool chat. We found a lot of natural synergy when it came to the way that we explain plants to people as well. So it was really, really fun. We had a big laugh there as well. But I've also got an exclusive news scoop from Kew Gardens because I've just been there this morning with Arno, and we've just been looking at the ghost orchid, which you've probably seen at Chelsea in the coverage. It did didn't flower in time for the Chelsea show, but I think that was great because it actually gave us a prolonged news story because it's now in flower at Q. By the time you hear this, it may or may not still be in bloom. So if you're heading to go on the Monday, then probably check first. But it's incredible. We had a great chat about the plant and it's all here exclusively. So thank you for joining us throughout this series. Our sponsor has been Stonely. They've done a really, really nice job of offering sustainable vegan wines to our listeners. And we hope you'll join us for the next series. Thank you very much. And I'll hand you over to my lovely colleague. Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast News. Your horticultural news roundup for the week. The most extensive study of the genetic relationships among orchids to date reveals that the flower's ability to grow on other plants actually evolved independently multiple times. A team of researchers led by Penn State biologists compared the sequences of 1,450 genes from 610 orchid species to reconstruct the orchid family tree and clarify the evolutionary relationships among the many subgroups. And it was actually found the ability to grow on other plants evolved at least 14 separate times. It's extremely rare for a new plant species to be discovered in Japan because the flora has been studied so extensively. But an elegant new orchid has been found hiding in plain sight. Recently, it's been uncovered a stunning new species of orchid that has rosy pink petals that look a bit like glasswork. So it's been spotted on an island in Tokyo. Uh, The species has been given the name Spiranthus hachijoensis. Um, And it can be found in other familiar environments as well, in the lawn, in parks, in private gardens and on balconies. So you never know what you might find. The wild orchid Habenaria radiata's pure white petals resemble a white egret in flight, hence its common name, which is the white egret orchid. But 
Scientists recently discovered that in their natural habitat, white egret orchids with the fringe removed produced fewer healthy seeds per individual fruit than intact plants. So hawk moths, which are the major pollinators of the orchid, normally grasp onto the fringe with their midlegs to steady themselves. Um, previously, it was thought that hawk moths hovered while drinking nectar, but actually the orchid has evolved over many, many years in order to attract the hawk moths so that they could produce more seed. Isn't nature wonderful? Hey guys, reporting for the Plant Based Podcast here, live at Kew Gardens and with Arno Ribeira because we've had him on the podcast in the past talking about orchids, but we've got a big story here today because the ghost orchid has just flowered. Welcome to the podcast, Arno. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for yeah. inviting me, Michael. And yeah, the ghost orchid actually flowered last week. Yeah. Um, and the ghost orchid is a species from from Florida and Cuba. Mm-hmm. And it's actually quite endangered because there are only, there are only around two thousand plants in the wild. Wow. Fifteen hundred in the US, five hundred in Cuba. So this is a real moment for Cuba. But of course, this is all part of the Chelsea Flower Show because you guys had put together a display with Grow Tropicals that incorporated the ghost orchid, but it wasn't in flower then. But tell us, kind of right from the beginning, what you were looking to achieve with that display. Yeah, so the display wanted to basically uh, divulgate orchid conservation to the general public. And for that, we partner with different institutions from the U.S., um, namely Illinois College, Chicago BC, Fairchild BC, mm-hmm. and Naples BC, the Smithsonian, uh, etc., etc., and also like Glasgow BC um, participated in it. And basically the idea was to create a display around the ghost orchid and Floridian plants mm-hmm. Um, and for that, the U.S. gardens brought, um, well, some plants back, mm-hmm. uh, mostly orchids, but also a few bromelias mm-hmm. and, and aroids. Okay, so the ghost orchid was really the star of the show, but it wasn't flowering in time. But when it was sent across, it was like a tiny little baby, wasn't it? So was it difficult to get it sent across? Um, Sending orchids is quite difficult because mm. it implies lots of paperwork. So mm-hmm. you have scientists, you have uh, phyto, um, phytosanitary uh, paperwork, etc. So it was quite a journey for the plant. Mm. This plant we have here, actually itself, when it was growing, it also you know, went through different places. So this plant here comes from seed uh, that was collected in one of the wildlife uh, <coughs> refuges mm-hmm. in Florida. And then from that uh, refuge, it went to the University of Florida, where mm-hmm. the seed was germinated. And from the University of Florida, it was sent to Chicago, BC. And from Chicago, it came to Kew. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, quite a long journey. Yeah, it really is. So tell us a bit of the history behind this orchid, because it's native to, I see, southwest Florida and Cuba as well. And it grows kind of in rainforest areas. Kind of what is this natural habitat and how and why is it endangered as well? Yeah, so this orchid grows in the swamps in mm-hmm. Florida. So uh, it mostly grows on cypress trees. Mm-hmm. And it's endangered because of two main things. One is poaching. Since these orchids are very slow growers, the one here in queue that you, we are seeing right now is nine years old. So, you know, it takes a long time for them to grow. Um, so people might go to the wild, poach them, poach mm-hmm. bigger specimens. Um, but they are also difficult to grow. So, you know, many times these specimens die. Mm-hmm. And then there was lots of logging for World War II. So lots of cypress trees were cut down and this decimated the population of these species. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the way that it grows, because a lot of people do expect that you'll find orchids in the rainforest in these sort of environments, but this is obviously quite different. And it almost like, does it, is it like an epiphyte? How does it grow? Yeah, it is an epiphyte. It grows on on top of the cypress trees. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's an epiphyte that has no leaves. So for Mm. this group of plants, basically they evolve to photosynthesize exclusively through the root system. Mm -hmm. And what we can see is just a root mass, so no leaves at all of any kind, and just a root ball um, where a spike emerges. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is why it also gets its name, because it looks like the flower is floating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really, really cool, isn't it? Wow. And what is the pollinator for this? Uh, The pollinator is a a moth. So Mm -hmm. you can see it has like an extremely long nectar spur. It belongs to the same group as as Darwin's orchid, Mm -hmm. uh, which has a similar Mm -hmm. flower in a way, also like wide, long nectar spur, Mm -hmm. um, etc. And is that moth, uh, obviously you haven't got much of this in the wild, but is the moth still present in the wild as well? The moth is still present, definitely. There's a nice documentary, uh, I think, recorded by uh, National Geographic photographers Mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, US studio, uh, where they actually uh, went on and discovered who the exact uh, moth species uh, mm -hmm. was, because it was not known until like five years ago or even mm -hmm. less than that. Um, yeah. Wow, it's absolutely amazing because it does look like it's floating. It's really incredible. And there's just one flower. Do you think we're going to get more flowers or this is the only no, one? No, no. Yeah. Normally they only produce one. Sometimes oh, really? I think they might produce a second bat after the first one wills. Uh-huh. Wow. And why do you think it didn't flower at Chelsea? I think it was just timing. Yeah. I mean, uh, this plant normally flowers for around two weeks. Okay. So getting it from the US slightly maybe out <laughs> of season maybe mm -hmm. because in the wild they tend to... Uh, flower around July, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, it was completely off-season in a way. Mm -hmm. I also shipped across, well, across the... Yeah, ocean. it's probably a little bit stressful. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have all these variables that you cannot really control. Uh -huh. But it's amazing that we have now got it to flower. And obviously, after Chelsea, it came back here to Kew, and it was still in bud at that point, was it? It was. Yeah, and it was like, oh, is it going to go? Is it going to go? <laughs> yeah, it started open, opening at the beginning of... Uh, last week yeah. so we took probably two or three days to fully open yeah, yeah wow and i love the intricacy of it like how did it get here from chelsea was it like uh like prize on in a car with a seatbelt on or <laughs> <laughs> in a way i mean it had its own plastic box yeah. with some sphagnum to uh, keep the humidity whoever drove that must have been so nervous right <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess so no and they yeah, had yeah. an international news story here you know is this the first time it's been flowered in the uk as well it probably is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, really cool. And you've had a lot of interest in this now, because it's been in flower since when? It's been in flower since Thursday last week. Okay, and you had visitors flocking from that very moment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, and that's why you've got all cordons and different queuing systems here, yeah. right? <laughs> but I love this. This is where kind of horticulture then jumps over into the mainstream, which I think is great for getting people interested in plants and understanding their importance, because you've had a lot of different news titles here, right? Who have you had? Yeah. Um, like BBC, yeah, kind of World BBC, News, Sky and, News, yeah. um, New Scientist, etc. Oh, that's amazing. And, what, and so how many more days have we got to go with this flower? Because it's not really ageing yet, is it? It is not. Hmm. Although when it ages, it does so quite quickly. Yeah. So maybe it has an extra week. Okay. And is anyone like watering it or is it getting what it needs from the atmosphere right No, now? no, no. Um, <coughs> it's watered every day. Mm -hmm. the, the with misting spray? Or? Yeah, 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 with fine spray. Okay. Um, and wow. trying not to get the flower too much. Uh -huh. Looks amazing. So after flowering, what, what's going to happen? So after flowering, this plant will be incorporated into Kiwi's orchid collection. Mm -hmm. Um, in the collection, we also have two different ghost orchids, so this will be a, our third species. Mm -hmm. um, but this one is quite cool because it's probably one of the flagship species mm -hmm. for orchid conservation. Wow, that's amazing. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. So, yeah, listen to the rest of the podcast, and you'll also hear me talking to Bree Langley about the water lily house as well. So thanks very much, guys. Okay, hey guys, really, really special podcast today. I'm here very early in the day at Kew Gardens with Bree Langley, and we're going to talk about the Water Lily House, because you redesign it every year, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, welcome to the podcast. Tell me about you and your role here at Kew. How long have you been here? So I've been at Kew for five years. Mm -hmm. um, I started as a um, specialist certificate uh, working in the glass houses, so that's like a one-year mm -hmm. focus on glass houses. I wanted to make sure what I was doing. Okay. Um, got the bug and didn't want to leave. So um, I then worked for two years in the temperate house and I've been two years in the palm house now. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And you've got a real passion for water plants, temp temperate plants, tropicals as well? Yeah, I think yeah. tropicals especially. Yeah. Um, I'm really into ecology, but <coughs> weird plants. Yeah, oh, me so too. Cool. Me so too. Cool. Oh. <laughs> well, I love coming to the water lily house and uh, I was upset today not to see the Aristolochia, which was looking so beautiful last year. But that's because the whole house is redesigned each year why is that yeah so it's one of the weird perks of the job yeah that you might not expect so um there's two staff members who mm -hmm. cover the palm house and the water lily house mm -hmm. and me as the second gets to 
kind of redesign the water lily mm -hmm. house every year which is really cool. cool so yeah all i need to keep is the victoria That's okay uh-huh but are the other water lilies then started from seed each year or how does that happen so it really depends on the water lily yeah. the victorias so the really large ones mm. that we think about and um, they're started from seed every year because yeah. they're just really easy to come and they're mm -hmm. so quick to okay grow. so you have a new victoria each year yeah. but it, the, you have to have a victoria that's yes. what you're basing everything around i mean that yeah. was why the place was built yeah so you got you got yeah, to do actually it. Do, do tell it. us a little bit about the history before we do okay. delve into the planting so the um the water lily house was built well it was first opened in 1852 mm -hmm. and it was all all down to this um, I mean it's a very Victorian idea mm -hmm. but this um, competition really to grow this new plant for the Queen so yeah. they found this plant in the Amazon mm -hmm. massive leaves and they called it Victoria yeah. after the Queen <laughs> and then there was this competition between all the large houses in the land oh to <laughs> flower this plant yeah. and give a bloom to the Queen um, so that was why this house was built in the first place <laughs> to enter what into time that would have been to kind of see topically as well and kind of I'm just imagining the newspaper articles at that point yeah because I yeah, mean yeah. this <laughs> this place would have so Kew was mm. open to the public at that time mm. the palm house was opened in 1848 mm -hmm. the temperate house was in construction mm. so this would have been a public garden yeah, yeah. so yeah the public would have been yeah, involved buzz. Yeah. yeah but uh, anyway we lost yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who won actually Chatsworth aha uh -huh. Yeah. This has started a long rivalry over I the know, years. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. but of course that was then purpose built for this and then ever since then it's always had a Victoria in each year? Um I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has yeah. it always been redesigned each year as well? I'm not sure, mm. but at least um ever since I've known it. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, I mean I know people here who've worked here for 40 odd years. Mm -hmm. Um it's that kind of place. Yeah. Um but um I think it's been the same all the way through so uh -huh. uh, as far as i know it's been redesigned okay and well, while we are talking about the victoria tell us a bit about that water lily obviously it's known for having babies posing on top <laughs> yeah but i think that's just because it's easy yeah um so the leaves are incredibly strong um and they've got this really amazing kind of intricate mm -hmm. system of veins underneath them which are filled with air which mm. makes them so strong and that's why um like one of the leaves was sent to Joseph Paxman when he was designing the Crystal Palace. Okay, um, yeah. They've been used to influence lots of architects yeah. over the years, bridges, that kind of thing. It's just a very, very strong structure. I think that's so fascinating. A lot of people don't realise that many materials are kind of derived from plants. The idea Absolutely. of the plant structures and yeah. inspired by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, we're, we're looking at um, lotus leaves at the moment to mm. influence uh, waterproof yes. clothing. So yeah. um, anyway, Amazing. off topic. No. Um, we love off topic <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so um the the plant the leaves themselves are incredibly strong but mm -hmm. they are quite brittle mm -hmm. um so it's very easy to put a child or a baby mm -hmm. onto a leaf yeah um and i think quite a lot of babies that are cute <laughs> babies um have been well, placed on yeah. leaves before uh, and still now um but it's just because it's easy and they're yeah. quite small and we a show, could, showpiece horticulture exactly well, but, but we not could available to the public this opportunity we just no, have to point no, out no 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 yeah. no 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 there are many risk assessments yeah. involved um but we could do it mm -hmm. so an adult could stand on them and one of my colleagues has done but you just need to mm -hmm. plan mm -hmm. so babies are easy mm -hmm. but adults you need to get a ladder out you need to have a big plastic tray underneath you because they are so brittle to mm -hmm. spread your weight mm -hmm. and then put all of your weight down at once and i remember also um i think this was the one on the green planet show where they then showed the obviously the spikes around the side which are then yeah. trying to obviously destroy other plants yes. around as it grows yeah. so it's quite an aggressive plant not just in size but in it kind of how it behaves and grows yeah. and kind of looks after itself yeah. protects itself. and those plants were provided yeah. by q oh really yeah oh, so yeah cool. so um no it's it's all tropical competition mm. so that's one of the yeah. reasons that i love <laughs> tropical plants is that yeah. it's really a battle Wow. And you really got to fight against it. And they everyone. did some great theatre in that show with oh, it as well, didn't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I love that that brought it into the mainstream and helped, you yes. know, everyday public understand plants in a, in a different way that they probably hadn't embraced before. No, because yeah. I think plants are very... I mean, I know myself, I did mm. biology at uni. I avoided plants like the plague really? because they were so boring. 
<laughs> and they were just like they're never taught right yeah and at school like there was nothing so it's how they're taught awful. it's not that they're boring it's awful. how they're taught right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then as soon as you start getting into them oh, it's actually really cool <laughs> exactly because <laughs> they've got so many weird things it's about how you kind of reframe them as well and i'm actually going to plug my own book here oh, okay. unusually <laughs> um i don't know if you said i've written a book called hortus curious which is all about strange and unusual plants and i really tried in there to write about them in a theatrical way so yeah. like uh for example with the Kaliana Major, the flying duck orchid, talking about the dating, the kind of way that it catfishes its potential date and all yeah, of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is how to get people's attention, isn't it, these days? It really... Well, maybe it always has been because, you know, you're telling the story in a different way that makes plants... Because plants somehow, they're these kind of uh, beings that people don't have the respect for. And maybe if you tell a story around it, then it kind of brings it to life a bit more. Yeah. I think we need to connect with them. And mm. an easy way to connect with something is to make it seem um, common to you. Yeah. So if yeah, you yeah, yeah. relate your experience to a Hollywood movie almost, I know exactly, it sounds cheesy, but exactly, it, it's fun. You as know, well. if there's a yeah. rom com or yeah. if there's a, <laughs> a psychotic killer or yeah, exactly. like whatever it is, they're all there like, in the plant world. So you yeah. can get it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, wow. So with the Victoria, just to touch on kind of, uh, it's obviously always in the news because babies can sit on it. It's kind of this big, biggest water lily in the world. But also, there's something really interesting about the flowering and the pollination, isn't there? Can you just run us through that? Yeah. So. So um, the flowers, I mean, a lot is made of them not lasting very long. But mm -hmm. to be honest with you, by the time it gets going, we'll get three blooms a week. Mm -hmm. So if you want to visit, you're, mm -hmm. you're very yeah, likely yeah. to see a flower. Yeah. <laughs> so don't so pla worry. Plants are not don't flowering worry. for public view. They're, well, this they're is doing their true. thing themselves. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Um, so <clears throat> the Victoria is a night flowering plant mm -hmm. and it has a very strong scent. It smells like pineapples. Mm. So when it first starts coming out, you'll smell this really 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 strong pineapple mm -hmm. smell and it actually heats up inside um, mm -hmm. it's called thermogenetic so it's um it's a very expensive thing mm -hmm. energy wise for that plant to do mm -hmm. but it's really pumping out the scent to make mm -hmm. sure that the pollinator is going to find it so these mm -hmm. um beetles mm -hmm. are going to find the right plant um and to begin with the female parts are mm -hmm. active so it's kind of relying on the fact that the beetles might have visited mm -hmm. another plant before mm -hmm. would these be sorry to button would they be flying beetles because obviously there's flowers in the middle of the water isn't it so yeah. i'm i don't entirely know but yeah, i think yeah. so so mm. i think that they are flowering they're quite big yeah, um, yeah. but they would be flying okay. yeah. yeah yeah sorry so yeah so the first night it then opens with so, this lovely pineapple fragrance yeah and, and then it's so it's a huge flower it's about big than a dinner plate it's more like a serving plate mm -hmm. right in the middle <laughs> the petals are really thick plasticky feeling yeah. um, and it's bright white and then in the middle it's got this kind of pink and yellow crown it's mm -hmm. really beautiful um, and then inside that crown is this huge almost like a disco hall uh -huh. we're going to keep it pg we'll call it a disco <laughs> hall uh, and that's where all of the beetles go. Yeah. And then it closes over them for 24 mm -hmm. hours. So like a lock-in. It traps them in. <laughs> the beetles have a whale of a time. <laughs> PG and non-PG. Yeah. Uh, and then they are... <laughs> and then slowly over the... beetles at a time? <laughs> Look, we not just judging. leave them too. We're not, <laughs> not no, judging. We're not judging. We're not judging. They're having a great time, yeah. what, however many there are. Okay. And um, <laughs> the flower slowly, um, so it's now closed up completely, and it slowly starts turning pink. Mm -hmm. And this is a symbol to us as viewers that it's starting to... Um, not become male mm -hmm. but the male parts are starting to become active mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, we were talking about um, David Attenborough mm. earlier on so you can see that as well in um, the recent series that he's done on the British Isles it does a really good bit about um, lords and ladies mm. the Aarons mm -hmm. so mm. you can see that the the female flowers being active and then the male flowers mm -hmm. exactly the same in mm. this yeah just a bit nicer smelling yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so the beetles are trapped the flower is turning pink once it's turned completely dark bright pink it will start to reopen again mm -hmm. because the male parts have started to become active the um so the the female part is the kind of the dance floor mm -hmm. if you like mm -hmm. of our disco yeah, hall yeah. and then the roof is made up 
of the um, the male parts. Mm-hmm. So that's where all the pollen's going to come. Mm-hmm. So when that starts to become active, the pollen starts dusting all of the beetles, and they can then push themselves out when the flower opens mm-hmm. and go on to the next mm-hmm. flower. So it's a really clever way yeah, of yeah. making sure that your pollinators are doing the job that they're supposed to do. Yeah, definitely. The beetles, their whole life cycle is kind of around these plants, mm-hmm. um, and the flowers themselves, they get something out of it as well. Mm-hmm. So it, win-win. Plants are so much more intelligent than us, aren't they? Um, yeah. We have to admit this. <laughs> <laughs> but then water lilies, they're one of the most um, early to evolve plants, mm-hmm. um, a bit like magnolias. Mm-hmm. So they have been doing this for a really long mm, time. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we are really recent compared skills, to water yeah. lilies. Yeah. <laughs> So kind of uh, in terms of like, you've got some other water lilies in there and a few other water plants as well. Yeah, what else have you got? um, In our heated pool, Mm -hmm. uh, we do lots of tropical water lilies. Mm -hmm. Lots of these are cultivars based on uh, Australian uh, water lilies. Mm -hmm. So these ones are kind of... um, they uh, they've evolved to deal with drought mm-hmm. or seasonal drought so they're really go-getters mm-hmm. as soon as the water comes in they'll flower really? the flowers on really tall done. stems <laughs> yeah. bright colors yeah. going pollinate me now oh. um, and then they'll die back down again when yeah. the droughts come and that's a really good way of yeah, us yeah, saving yeah. them afterwards as well oh. if we need to save those that's plants really interesting. for next year so we that... can trick them into feeling that they're drought and then they really? will kind of go dormant uh-huh. and then we can kick start them again oh my gosh wow yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but we've got a few other things in there. We've got something called hydroclase, which mm-hmm. is not a name that anybody's going to remember, but it's called water poppy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a really lovely yellow mm-hmm. lemon, and mm-hmm. it literally just looks like poppies yeah. lying on the surface. <laughs> um, and then round the corners, we've got um, lotus. Yeah. We've got water lettuce which oh i love that the feel of that that's another inspirational material yeah isn't it? so it's a bit like yeah. a lamb's ear almost yeah. it feels the same um, but obviously a monster in the wild very invasive right? yes yeah. yes and similarly invasive mm. the water hyacinth oh of course yeah yeah but i think q's now and looking tangles at that. together as well doesn't yeah. it it's real but awful. I've, I've seen there's um i think q's now uh researching that as a potential energy source mm-hmm. um that's cool. and a water chestnuts did i say water chestnut in there Oh, I don't know. Not sure. Or maybe there's a similar plant with this kind of checkerboard kind of leaf. Uh, what is that? So, yeah. oh, I don't know what its common name is, mm. but um, the um, it, it's Ludwigia sedoides. That's it. With a yellow flower, right? Yes. Yes, I love it's that. It's beautiful. Oh. So there's um, Ludwigia helminthoriza, which again mm-hmm. just rolls off the tongue. It's, <laughs> um, I think it's actually quite rare, but it's... A weed. Yeah. <laughs> like whenever we've grown it, yeah. it just goes mad. That's so right. I'm trying to focus on the sedoides, which, as you say, is like yeah, hexagonal yeah. almost. Yes. It's really, really beautiful and delicate, and yeah. I'm hoping that that kind of fills the space uh-huh. but doesn't go as yeah. mad as the other one. It's quite exciting because you're kind of designing a garden on water. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you have any of the... Uh, in my book, I've written about the smallest plant in the world, the Wolfia globosa. Have you got any of that? Uh, like a tiny, no, tiny duckweed. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Again, that's a type of arum, isn't yeah, it? That's yeah, related really, to our lords and ladies. And edible as well. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is okay. interesting. Yeah, so. um, no, I don't have any of that. I've got mm. common as muck. Uh-huh. Pondweed. Oh, uh. <laughs> Out of my ears. Um, so that's that's today's job. <laughs> uh-huh, that's cool. But um, in terms of the water lilies, like any tips for people at home who might be growing water lilies? Because what you've got here are the, the tropical ones, which yeah. wouldn't be so easy to grow. But maybe uh, you can get lots of micro water lilies. Is there some that yeah. you could then grow indoors, maybe? Some of those? You could grow some of mm. those indoors. I mean, it would be... Um, I suppose a restricted clientele Mm. uh, because you'd have to heat the water be Ah, quite expensive Uh, Um, so it's not good enough at just being indoors I don't think so the water's got to be hot as well Um, so we heat our water to minimum of 25 okay Um, Uh so yeah it sounds very swimmable Uh, it's very nice (laughs) it's very nice it's not quite a bath yeah but it's nice (laughs) Um, but yeah lots lots of water lilies are very easy Mm. to grow at home in like an outside pond or even just a bucket how much depth do they really need because like um, when I was a kid, I tried to have an outdoor pond in a barrel, but 
I'm not sure I had it deep enough necessarily. Oh, ah, yeah. um, I think they do need to be relatively deep, mm. but these are, um, it would really depend on the species that you uh -huh. buy. Okay. So lots of aquatic nurseries are really, really good at giving advice. Mm -hmm. You can also get lots of advice from the RHS website. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding at the moment is hitting charity shops. Mm -hmm. There are so many books on ah, water plants and they really? are so cheap. Yeah, That's so much information. Uh -huh. Oh. There's, oh. there's some live action from oh your walkie-talkie. Oh what is that? I'll Rebecca, turn it off. Rebecca, your emergency in Unit 5. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell us a bit more about the redesign because, like, uh, we've talked about the water plants, but you've also got the whole outside of the water lily house is a border. Yeah. And in there, we've got a lot of things that people would usually recognise as house plants, a few things that are a bit more exotic as well, quite a few nice passiflora as well. Yeah. Just chat us through a few of the star plants that you've got there. So, yeah, as you said, the mm. flora. So one of my main aims for this year is to really showcase that genus, mm. that group of plants. Oh, I need to... Um, I don't know if you know... I was in uh, Italy last week for the Autocolo, which is like their main flower show. Okay. There was an amazing Passiflora supplier there. They actually won an award. Oh. I'll try and dig out the name for you because they had some really, really unique species there as well. Lovely. Yeah, cool. really, really cool. Anyway, sorry. That's okay. We, we um, segue all over the place. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. So um, here in Kew, we have a... a tropical nursery which is behind the scenes mm -hmm. and that is one of the most biodiverse places mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. um, second only I think to the, the our seed bank in yeah. Wakehurst um, so tons of plants all crammed in together yeah. um, uh, you can access it through tours yeah um, I've been there a few years ago with uh, uh, Carlos actually yeah uh, interesting uh, yeah, so. um, don't so, tell anyone obviously. yeah don't tell anyone <laughs> it's all secret um, but anyway it's really great fun yeah. going around there as somebody who is um, I work with uh, my colleagues in the nursery a lot mm -hmm. but also it's amazing going around and going oh you know I could really use that um, plant next year it's like a big maybe shop I could <laughs> I have a few times gone in and just gone I'm going shopping <laughs> so cool. with permission um, I guess that's what it's like with a lot of these areas at Kew there's obviously areas behind the scenes where the plants are grown and then yeah. when you're then going to redesign the area or replant you kind of go and see what is available absolutely. In, the, in the shop behind the scenes absolutely yeah. and then I can get the, the inside intel on how to grow them mm. and how they can grow best and mm -hmm. It also helps them because mm -hmm. I'll be able to grow these plants much bigger than yeah, what yeah. their space would allow, okay. so they might act in a completely different way. Oh. So it's almost like, uh, just to go into the staff element there, is it almost like two separate teams then? You've kind of got the guys growing the plants behind the scenes and then the guys that are growing the plants in the showcase element. Yeah. I guess there's two different we're ways of growing of the, there, isn't we're it? We're part of yeah. the same department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but very different, different tasks. Teams. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. interesting. Well, it's different, um, yeah. uh, I suppose, um, experience mm. and Yeah, 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 of course. Needed. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so back to Passiflora then. Passiflora. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, try as I might, I'd love to be really edgy and stuff with my designs, but it yeah. all goes incredibly girly no matter what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I've By got girly, lots what do you of Passiflora and they're so flowery and it's amazing. Oh, they're um, lovely. So what I really wanted this year was to have lots of fun. Last year was mm. my first year kind of um, designing yeah. uh, most of it from scratch and I found it kind of quite I think I was uh, pairing the plants too much yeah. this year I wanted lots and lots of fun lots okay. of flowers yeah, yeah. so I wanted passiflora <coughs> everywhere we're going to get them out the nursery yeah. we're going to get them in public view um, and I wanted lots of different colours mm -hmm. right next to each other lots of clashes mm -hmm. and I wanted that kind of continuation of flowers as mm -hmm. well so lots of them will flower lots of the time mm -hmm. other ones will only flower in spring okay. other ones only mm -hmm. late, much later on so and they've obviously got the speed to then give you that coverage and that kind of yeah. blanket curtaining yes. that you get in there as yeah, well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. that's amazing and some of them have a bit of a fragrance as well don't they some yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think some of the ones that I'm finding at the moment are a bit not nice smelling like uh, um, uh. Fuetida ah uh, of um, course yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah I guess you know it's always subjective yes absolutely <laughs> But um, also in there, you've got, uh, just as you walk in, you've got lovely kind of like rock kind of mud display, almost like, yeah. almost looks like paddy fields, is that the... It's exactly yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
We, I was like, we, I hope it is paddy fields and not some different design. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredibly insulting. How could you not know? Um, no, no, no. So, um, the, yeah. So this year, the idea was to make the whole of the entranceway aquatic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we might go even more that way mm-hmm. next year. Um, but um, we've been adding more and more aquatic plants to the entrance. Normally, mm. it's just um, planted, yeah, just yeah. a normal bed. Yeah. Um, but we've been making more and more ponds. And this year, uh-huh. we just did all ponds. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all paddy field. It's terraced. Yeah. Um, I've been mostly influenced aesthetically by um, the paddy fields in Yunnan. Mm-hmm. Um, I just find them absolutely oh, beautiful. Yeah. I love those kind of really organic shapes, very yeah, uneven. Yeah. Um, but um, this is not a, a such a practical yeah. um, place to do it. <coughs> so um, these ones are all made out of scraps that mm-hmm. I've kind of begged and steal from wow. lots of different it's teams amazing, around the though. garden. It's beautiful. Scrap metal, scrap um, soil, scrap grass, scrap netting, yeah. uh, bits of wood, yeah. um, nails, just random stuff that people have kind of squirreled away and gone, mm. oh, that'll be useful sometime. Mm-hmm. And I've gone, hi. <laughs> Perfect way of recycling the materials. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So it has a very kind of organic Mm -hmm. let's say feel to it but Mm -hmm. it's it's big it's tall um there's three layers on each side at least um and we've just kind of made it look really natural with Mm -hmm. lots of moss and things but we've got two different types of rice Mm -hmm. um and we are um doing successional planting so Mm -hmm. i'd really like to showcase um how an agricultural system works Mm -hmm. how um farmers get the most out of uh, Mm -hmm. their land Mm -hmm. and to get a successive harvest Mm -hmm. Um, so I studied sustainable agriculture as my postgrad so um, yeah yeah, really really interested and it'd be amazing to kind of transfer that to um, talking to the public Mm -hmm. we often grow rice Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to as you like that connection with Mm. plants yeah 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 seeing rice on the ground so you'll you'll get it some fruiting in here yeah 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 yeah. excellent wow that's cool (laughs) I love the um it's obviously not in this, there, but there's a black-leaved rice. Yeah, well, yeah. we do have, have one called one Black here? Madras. <gasps> oh, it's my not God, I love quite that one. black. Yeah. But it's, it's, um, oh, it's black to me. Okay. It's marketing black. It's, it's, it's purple and then yeah, it's got yeah, red yeah. edging. Yeah. Nothing's quite black. It's really lovely, really yeah. lovely. Aha, uh-huh, that is cool. Wow. Yeah. Um, and obviously around the sides, we've got other things like a, a califa, which is yes. not often grown as a houseplant, but could be. And this is with these lovely red tassels. And that is almost one of the plants you have most years, isn't it, as well? Like yes. Plants that people perhaps expect from this water lily house yeah, as well a few yeah. of those yeah. um so uh. yeah there's so this is one of those weird things mm. where um different people will pronounce things different ways i always uh. pronounce things completely differently to yeah. most other people so i would say akalifa okay it's completely up to you to that would be um it. yeah it's funny because a lot of things uh because i spend a lot of time in holland so a lot of things i might pronounce in a dutch way sometimes no but lots but of people how you're say saying that is more of a dutch way actually yeah. uh. Because they would say uh, Echinacea yeah. instead of Echinacea or uh, Achillea instead of Achillea. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Well, this is it, like, universal it, language. It, well, this is, I mean, we, we talk about plant names being mm. universal, but yeah, yeah. no matter what, you're always going to bring yeah. your own pronunciation. It's only universal and, when it's written down. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, how yes. did you say it? A Khalifa. A Khalifa, yeah. That sounds cooler. That sounds like a rapper. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Tons of people yeah. here say a uh, Khalifa as well. So it's it's just one of those things where your brain has to go, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, got you now. But it's beautiful because it's got those red tassels. And there's also the one like Joseph's coat as well, isn't there, with all the different colours? Uh, yeah, oh, that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Khalifa as well. No. No. So that one is a Pseudoranthemum versicolor. Oh, God. Oh, no, sorry. That is one it? is... Um, oh, Okay, there's multiple. <laughs> what is it, a cadeum? There are so many. Okay, so I think what you're talking about there yeah. is Akalifa macrostaca. Maybe. Which is a kind of peaches and pinks and whites yes, all mixed yes. together in a awesome bit of green. Plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there's also a Pseudoranthemum uh, versicolor, yeah. which is like a um, 
purple, white, mm-hmm. and pink. We'll put pictures up of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, the, the, yeah. The, yeah. There's, it's a very um, there's a lot of different clashes mm. going on. And but that's what you were doing with the design, wasn't it? A celebration yeah. of colour, tropical colours, kind of really transporting people to another another place. Yeah. yeah. I wanted it to be fun. I wanted it to be like kind of step, stepping into a circus tent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just a bit mad and a bit fun. It makes you feel <sighs> cool. good going in. Yeah. You know that when you kind definitely, of go into a definitely. space and it makes yeah. you kind of feel uplifted mm. and happy. Do you know what that also makes it? What? Very Instagrammable. Well... <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I didn't think about that. Um, <laughs> but you've also got on the rails around, you've yeah. got uh, Ipomia, haven't you? Yes. Which a lot of people will know the Latin name for Morning Glory, but this is a very different one, probably more closely related to Sweet Potato, isn't it? What what species have you Ooh, got kind of running around so. there? Um, yeah. it's a, In I its p- look and structure. It, it's Ipomia yeah. Mauritiana, so it's from mm-hmm. Mauritius. It's mm-hmm. basically just a tropical version yeah. of Morning Glory. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of... Uh, what would you call it? Mauve flower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite big. Yeah, be nice um, quite bright. Mm-hmm. It will flower continuously. Mm. Um, and those plants are only four years old now. Uh-huh. So um, they've, they've taken over yeah. <laughs> completely. So we chop those back yeah. to just sticks okay. over the winter. Yeah, yeah. And they grow back so quickly. Um, they take over the whole of the railings. And yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about putting some wires up to try and get uh, them into the roof ooh, as well, nice. which would be really cool. <gasps> curtains. Yeah. It for me a curtains. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess you're so blessed in here at having the speed of growth yes. from everything. Like when you're outdoors, you're really, you know, a lot of these plants, we kind of have to wait for them to grow and kind of, yeah. you're kind of doing the opposite in there. Yeah. It's trying to stop them growing. Right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think this year I'd really love them to go absolutely wild. Yeah. Um, but this is the joy of tropical plants. They yeah. grow so quick. Definitely. Um, wow. Just, well, specific ones, mm-hmm. I should say. It doesn't happen to all of them. Mm. Um, but yeah, they do grow so quickly. So that's... That's, that's a really good thing to also bear in mind if you've got house plants. Yeah. They can be so expensive. Just mm. buy the smaller yeah, one because yeah. it'll get there, you know. But it is, I always find it's very hard with house plants, especially more tropical ones, because we kind of, um, you know, a lot of beginners kind of the plants don't grow or they're not successful and they kind of blame themselves. But kind of what you're trying to do is put a tropical plant from the rainforest or somewhere yeah. like that into a UK house, which is already a difficult job, isn't it? I mean, we actually have <laughs> yeah. a much easier deal here mm. because we have the environment and yeah, also. Of course all the plants are in beds as Mm. soon as you put a plant into a pot it becomes so much harder Mm. so people should never normalize indoor beds in houses for plants that'd be really cool (laughs) or just even even give yourself a bit of lee room by um making it a window box rather than Mm. just a small pot well this is a very interesting angle to go down actually because um i often i've done a lot of different container work over the years with obviously mixed containers for outdoors which is very normal to make a hanging basket with a number of different species a number of different genus we don't do that with house plants so you're suggesting that this is a good thing to do with house because you've obviously got to match up the species pretty well you know maybe a family of bromeliads for example but like i've always wanted to do this with house plants but people generally don't do that they shy away from mixing more than one house plant in a container don't they yeah yeah what do you feel about that don't see anything wrong with it. Mm, I think it might actually yeah. benefit. So um, yeah. lots of tropical plants work really well together. They mm. actually help each other. Absolutely. Um, they build communities, yeah. um, and I th- it would really help you with your mm. watering. Yes, as well. To have a much yeah. bigger space with the soil. So that's mm. one of the main things here. We've got more soil, mm. so it would help you if you know that you overwater mm. or. Uh, yeah. It would help you. So, so there's more plants to take that up, yeah, yeah. Um, and the ones that don't need it, could, they don't have to take it up. Mm. The ones that do, totally. they would. So totally. that it could really, really help. Oh, I feel really inspired to do a project now. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. But I think also what you really should know is mm. that, and the same thing here as well. Plants will decide to grow. Yeah. So don't beat yourself up. Yeah, exactly. And if it does exactly. die, you've got a free pot. Yeah. So definitely. go and find something else that works for you. <laughs> I know. Don't beat yourself up at all. It's <laughs> not your fault. Something I do do a lot is, um, and I actually learned it, uh, I don't know if you know the Clapton Tram, which is like a photo location over in East London. Uh-huh. And they've got, it's like, it's basically, 
basically this like old tram shed with all lots of lovely houseplants hanging and oh. they film pop videos there and different content and such and the guy actually underplants his fiddle leaf figs um, and kind of like yuccas and cordelines with uh, mind your own business you know the yeah. helxine solirea uh, but also with spider plants as well as an underplanting yeah. because of course when you underplant your plants you're going to get less fungus gnats because you're covering the soil as well so yeah. I, I find with houseplants I see too much bare soil as well and that is also not very nice yeah oh, I suppose and harder to manage as well true yeah. true I suppose mm. it depends on the look that you're going for but mm, yeah if, if people want to experiment at home yeah, totally. yeah be cool there to find out what happens definitely there's something else I want to tell you about um, so I'm just going on so many tangents it's alright it's alright I all really right. enjoy chatting to you <laughs> um, there's a company I think they're actually a houseplant shop in Indonesia called Atelier uh, TE and you'll find them on Instagram and they're doing Kokodama but with more than one plant in a Kokodama and they call it Tanem Dharma and it's really interesting because they mix up very different kind of species and genus in there and they look so theatrical and yeah. beautiful and I think sometimes again now, now we're on the on the path of houseplants which I didn't expect at all <laughs> is we're looking so long term with sometimes planters and containers and kind of you know what I do with a lot of my outdoor container work is you know it might look good for maybe six you know four months three or four months which is kind of longer than a bunch of flowers would look good yeah and you always invest you know i bought some flowers for 20 quid the other day it's like yeah. i might spend that on a house plant but i kind of want that house plant to live forever why yeah. is that you know yeah. it's a weird concept sometimes yeah. yeah but check them out it's really really cool oh, what cool. they do yeah no i mean that makes mm. a lot of sense because a lot of epiphytes um they build their own community so you've of got course. moss yeah. you've got Definitely. orchids ferns mm. everything's living together everything's helping each other mm. and that's something we kind of need to get away from i yeah. i mean it's easier in a botanic garden to label everything if it's mm. separate but I would love it if we could combine things a lot yeah, more because definitely it would look more natural yeah. and it would probably help the plants totally and when you look this up you'll see that um, very often they're using like platycerium you know yeah, the stanchion yeah. fern and then kind of orchids are then coming through there and it's almost like it's yeah. a cradle for yeah. the the beauty of the other house plants as yeah. well it's real artful really yeah is. yeah Oh my gosh, I've had yeah. such fun chatting to you. Oh, Thank fine. you so much. So we talked about the Water Lily House here at Kew, which has been redesigned by you, Brie, and it's redesigned every year. Yeah. People can obviously visit by booking a ticket at Kew. You can buy it on the door. If you're a member, you obviously get in with your membership. But what are the actual opening times of the Water Lily House here? So the Water Lily House is open from 10 till 5 during the summer. Mm -hmm. It will get slightly shorter later on in the year, but we um, are open from April to October. Okay. And then cool. we completely empty it and mm -hmm. start again the next year. <laughs> and it does get hot in there, right? Because that's it why you're does, in shorts today. <laughs> it does, yeah. Um, Do you wear shorts in the winter as well? <laughs> no, there? not quite. But then I am a wuss now. Uh, uh, nah. I, so I've been used to living in kind of tropical <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this is going to be our, our hottest house in mm -hmm. queue. Mm -hmm. So it could quite easily be 37 degrees in there and 80% mm. humidity, which okay. is... It's it's difficult to kind of describe, but it's, yeah. it's almost as if you're surrounded by water. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get on wearing glasses? I have to ask. Okay. Um, <laughs> patience. Yeah. Um, and um, I just every so often just kind of you've just got to wipe your glasses yeah. and just deal with yeah. it maybe just wow. take some glass cleaner or something not I've ended a, up just using soap not a bad problem to have when you're surrounded by those amazing plants no, so that's no. Cool. hey thank you very much for today I really really enjoyed it ah oh, no worries <laughs> nice to meet you. you and we've come to the end of series 11 of the plant-based podcast can you believe it we can't <laughs> thank you so much to everyone who listens to this podcast everyone who downloads it we really couldn't do it without you thank you so much to our sponsors for series 11 which is stonely wines please go and check them out and also to our amazing four contributors for series 11 um, megan the carnivorous plant girl with all of her amazing information about carnivorous plants it's really inspired me definitely to grow some more beardy gardener with some awesome gardening tips go and follow him on instagram and social media wherever you can find him alstroemeria ben who is always so full of enthusiasm for amazing alstroemerias he is awesome thank you ben and andrew wayne 
always bringing the gardening tips and the giggles. You must definitely go and check him out on Instagram for his quirky, fun gardening tools and information as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for everyone who's been um, a guest on this series. And also, of course, I have to say it, to Michael for being, you know, co-podcast host because he's all right really (laughs) series 12 coming up very soon in just two weeks in fact 25th of june we'll be back be ready to download the first episode of the new series thanks everyone Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Stonely Wines. Their premium wines in New Zealand are made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified also. Our favourite, Stonely Sauvignon Blanc, displays fresh and vibrant aromas of passion fruit and citrus with crisp notes. We have our exclusive discount code for 20% off Stonely Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. The music for the Plump Ace podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Semi Echo.